I seem to be missing uh, two of my key panelists, but you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll start um, with the introduction uh, for this panel. Um, so I'm Kathy Phillips. Uh, here's one of my panelists, another one. Oh, great. Okay. Everybody's here. So, um, to get started, uh, I'm Kathy Phillips. I'm Executive Director of ST Coastal Trust, um, an environmental advocacy organization down on the lower eastern shore of Maryland. And um, I'm also the, some of you may be familiar with river keepers, water keepers. I'm the ST Coast Keeper, so I'm the water keeper uh, for the coastal base of uh, Maryland and northern Accomack County, Virginia. So, um, <coughs> We're going to talk today about sort of the evolution of a piece of legislation that is still, after two years, trying to work its way through the state legislature, and our panelists will um, will talk to you about that. But I'm just going to very quickly tell you how we got to the Community Health Care Act in that agriculture on the eastern shore of Maryland has drastically changed over the last um, 50 to 60 years. Um, Delmarva, as it's known, um, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, the eastern shore uh, portion, um, was once a very diverse agricultural community. Uh, you had true family farms um, that, sure, some of them raised chickens, some of them raised cows, um, they also grew row crops, orchards were a big agricultural industry on the eastern shore for many years. Um, and so we had this diverse system of agriculture. It was uh, very self-sustaining, it was non-polluting or not as polluting as industrial agriculture. But unfortunately, um, over the years, uh, with the Tyson inventing the um, vertical integration system of poultry and animal food production in the Midwest, which then was picked up by um, Frank Perdue and brought to the Eastern Shore. Um, small farms began to disappear. Uh, small, small farms of maybe 200, 300 acres began to be combined into uh, farms of thousands and thousands of acres and um, where a small farm may have had a couple of chicken houses growing you know, maybe 2,000 at the most chickens, um, the whole model of growing poultry changed. And we have now today, uh, we have totally lost our family farm uh, system of agriculture. We have totally industrialized agriculture on the eastern shore. The only two, there's two crops grown on the eastern shore. Um, and that is corn and soybeans. And that's not to feed us, that's to feed the chickens. And um, then we have a massive uh, poultry industry on the eastern shore. And um, in fact, I should have had this little slide behind me as we were doing that. Um, so that is where we are now. And because of agriculture being industrialized, uh, we are having greater levels of pollution uh, to the water, to the air, and this is what our panelists are going to discuss today. Um, so our first panelist is, um, and I was reminded, but I'm not sure I have to say this to everybody in the audience, but Concentrated Animal Feeding Operations, CAFO, CAFO, is what we have here on the Eastern Shore um, now. And this is down in Somerset County where uh, it's highly, highly concentrated. It's so dense and it's, it's causing a real problem. So I am going to turn this over and introduce our first panelist, uh, Monica Brooks. If you were here for the panel just before us, uh, you've already met Monica, but for those who haven't, um, Monica is a board member of SRAP, Socially Responsible Agricultural Pro Project. And um, she's also one of the co-founders of the Concerned Citizens Against Industrial CAFOs. That's why I gave you the little introduction about CAFOs just a second ago. <laughs> so uh, it's one of my favorite photos of Monica. One of my least so, favorites. But anyway. <laughs> so take it away, Monica. <laughs> Monica's going to tell you a little bit about how citizens became engaged and yeah. organized and um, 
how we got to the community up here. <laughs> yeah. So some of you um, who were here earlier, um, kind of like I did a quick zoom through on, you know, how we came to be. But um, I tell you, I, it's interesting. If you, um, I think in every, everyone knows someone that they believe is bold or they think, oh, they'll do it. <laughs> or they'll talk to that person. Um, I was always that person. <laughs> so um, we had friends in the, just friends that played professional sports and we might get free tickets and things. And if there was one ticket by themselves, they would say, well, give it to Monica because she'll make friends to whoever she's sitting next to. So my neighbor found out through her, our county representative, who is a member of her church, in a just a by the by, oh, there's this project coming and it's, you know, these capos. Just really nonchalantly said it. And she said, what? And she said, well, why are you being so matter of fact about it? This is, so what did she do? She came and told me. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm telling you because I know you're going to do something. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so I was not very educated. This was the end of 2014, um, around the holidays when this information came out. So I considered it was done purposefully. People were thinking about Christmas and Thanksgiving. And so no one's really looking at the news and pretty much in our area, the biggest news is the weather. Pretty much there's not a lot of stuff that goes on. Um, so I did my research. I started educating myself as best as I could. I created an online flyer the same day and I made flyers. Um, and I just emailed anybody I knew and I just started going door to door passing this stuff out um, to see if anybody else knew this. Does anybody know this? Um, because I'm not originally from the area and so I don't have a huge network of family and friends to get information from. So I found nobody knew. Everyone's saying, what? We don't know anything about this. So we connect, I connected with another um, neighborhood who ended up finding out because that same council person lives in their neighborhood. And we connected and we formed Concerned Citizens Against Industrial CAFOs. We just immediately formed a group. We started having meetings. We told anybody who wants to come, come on down. Let's tell you what this is about. We decided we we're going to first educate people about, um, I'm just going to here so I can see what's up here. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, see, there's some of our people. Yeah, so, people got very creative with their signs. So we first just started doing lots of, you know, hello, everybody. This is what's going on. Don't you care? We did meetings, we educated, we started connecting, forming alliances um, with other groups, established groups, um, ST Coastal Trust and um, different ones. And then we, from us running our miles through the papers, we created a huge sign, this particular. Now that sign there that you're seeing is not where, of course, ours, um, but the project itself would have been 13 of them on a no land CAFO, but right on top of the Paleo Channel, the Paleo Channel for us is the source of our water. It is a shallow aquifer. These are some of the signs that we did. It's a shallow aquifer. So we're on well water. So we're saying you're going to put 13 factory farms on top of the source of our water and you don't think it's a problem? You're stupid. <laughs> and so we're going to these meetings. We're telling them this is absurd. We don't want it. They first tried to say we're stupid. We don't. You're you're not educated. You don't have local information. So we started providing local information. They said it's only a few of you. Well, you see, it's not a few of us. So we started bringing more people because we started emboldening others to speak. Because someone said, well, you go ahead and speak for us, and they saw the same few five or six people. So they said, oh, that's all, you guys are the only ones. So we said, all right. So we just strategically brought in one group, one week senior citizens, and next week. You know, children's focus group, daycares, anybody. Highly affected communities. And so to try to get them to see, first of all, how idiotic it is what we to put on the Paleo Channel, certainly. But in addition, we do not want this for our air or our water um, in the community. We don't want it. So we organize and we, Center for a Little Future and Johns Hopkins, all these different groups started to hear about us, SREP, Socially Responsible Agriculture Project. Maria came in, um, Payan here from the SRAP, to help focus our energies. Because when you don't know what to do, you're just kind of 
you're just grasping at straws, you don't know, but she helped us to get strategic um, with our information. And of course, all of it was really for naught because our local people were in the pocket of the poultry industry. Purdue is headquartered in Salisbury, Maryland. They built the Purdue School of Business, which is a lovely, huge institution. There's a Purdue Wellness Center. They have now put their training facilities in downtown Salisbury with a big old Purdue sign. Everywhere you go, it's Purdue Purdue. You see the trucks constantly going through towns. Many people in the community work in the industry or they have family that works in the industry. So that was part of our thing that we discovered. There were people who were against it. We had an independent poll that was done, um, specifically letting people, the whole state of Maryland, and then we did an Eastern Shore one that showed at least 70% of people did not want these things at all. Um, and so we did our due diligence, but the community itself, our le local legislators, were just not interested. They were just, they told us, oh, well, they're the ones who provide the income for our area. Um, well, you don't have enough information. You don't have local information. Well, this is new. This, see, if you go to Wisconsin, there's mega dairy farms. They've been around, and people have been fighting mega dairy farms. They've been around. You go to North Carolina, mega hog farms. It's a nightmare for the people down there. They're spraying hog manure all over people's houses and everything. The mega poultry is newer. That is the, that's the next thing. So but going from family farms, so now you have the mega poultry farms that are sprouting up and the egg farms, and so there's not as much historical data. And so the data we had was not from our state, but as Maria said last session, manure is manure, nitrates and nitrate, ammonia is ammonia, no matter where you go, it's all the same. But they would do anything that they could to halt us. We wrote letters to our local politicians. We had meetings face to face with them that were initially hopeful, which turned into hostility, where we got to the point where we just looked them straight in the eye and said, you're a liar, you know, you're not gonna do anything for us, so why are you even talking to me? That's where we went to. So we went beyond the Eastern Shore. Because if I am on fire, and Boston PD shows up, I'm not gonna say, you're not Eastern Shore PD, get out of here. I need Eastern Shore PD to put me out. No, if I need help, I'm gonna call for help. I don't care who comes. I don't care what you look like, what you smell, I don't care, come help me. So we, um, as a result of what we were dealing with here, um, I also mentioned earlier about um, a health assessment. So one of the things that they said, you need a health, there's no health, we asked for a health assessment. They said, we can't afford to do a health assessment. There's no money for that. Where are you gonna get the money for that? Um, we were asking for um, information, you know, through the Information Act. Then they wanna charge us hundreds, over a thousand dollars for the information from the county. Um, we gave them a riot act about that, so we eventually got the information. So we asked for this health assessment, but they said they couldn't do it, and we found out that they did one, and we found out through another whole other county, um, which was Cecil County, where Purdue was trying to go, and the people there have put up huge signs saying, Purdue, we don't want you. On the highway, you're on the highway. Um, that through there, that they mentioned, like Comico County Health Impact Assessment, and we said, say what now? <laughs> so Maria found out, and we said, went to the health department, you guys did a health assessment? We asked for a health assessment for months, more than a year, and you said you couldn't do one, but you've done one? Let's see it, can we see, you know? And we went through it and it was horrible. It was very faulty. They utilized information from people who were extremely biased in the industry, and as a matter of fact, they got input from um, a council member that has no, you know, they're not a, health official so it was very biased but the one good thing that came out of that in health impact assessment that we got to utilize was they mentioned that the area where this CAFO was going into was 80% African American and I was like you don't say 
<laughs> now, that's interesting because Wicomico County is about 20%, maybe African American. So how do we get an 80% neighborhood that is going to be the new home of 13, 600 by 400 foot CAFOs, and that's not gonna be a problem. That's a problem. So I was like, well, thanks for that information. So I started spreading the word, oh! You know, because again, I will say this, whether it was done purposely or not, guess what, don't care, because you don't want it. When you're dealing with these kinds of things and the people that you're coming against, they pull every trick in the book. They lie, they cheat and steal. They try to defame you. We had people that lost their jobs. We lost the contracts for the work that we do. Fortunately, we own a construction company. But fortunately for us, 75% of our business is not in the Eastern Shore. So we're like, whatever, you know. But for the people that are relying upon their income, they were working in government jobs or particular industries. Well, our girl lost her job with this group that became owned by Salisbury University, who of course has produced School of Business, um, which we found out they weren't a big fan once we were scheduling, I think, one of our town halls there, and then they realized what we were doing, and then they said, you can't come here. That's our government. So, oh, I, oh okay, so, sorry, so the short form is, um, when you need the help, you'll do whatever you need to do to get it. And when you realize that you don't have the local resources at your disposal, then you go beyond. And that's what we did. We reached out beyond, and no one wanted to help until we found a senator who wanted to help us because we found out one in four of our kids in middle school have asthma. Uh, we have the highest respiratory rates in the whole state of Maryland on the Eastern Shore. So we know we have a problem. We wanted to get something done about that, which is, um, bringing us to this Community Healthy Air Act, which we are looking at as a way for us to get the information that they say we don't have. <laughs> so as Monica explained to you, this is why they had to go across the uh, Chesapeake Bay, which raised the ire of every elected official on the Eastern Shore. Um, and, uh, but. Monica and her group got to Annapolis. And now I'm introducing Dr. Keith Nachman from Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future. And Keith has his own little slide um, show. So do you want to come up and use the podium? And he's going to tell you, he's going to explain to you how everything um, is, how they got to Annapolis, what was brought up in Annapolis. and. Um, Um, thank you, Kathy. It's really an honor to be here with Monica, with Dr. Hall, with Maria, with Kathy. I think the work that you do organizing the community is essential to making change. And uh, I can't do a lot of that myself in the role that I fill. So I'm happy that I have such amazing people like you doing that. And we're happy we have amazing people like you. Well, like you. Well, yeah. Like so, so, so where I, I can try and help is uh, on that health-based advocacy side through things like legislation and through things like research. So I'm going to talk today about a piece of legislation, the Community Healthy Air Act, which is the basis for why we're here. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got involved, uh, the evidence base for doing anything through the act, and uh, what the act uh, is purported to do if it were to be passed. Okay? And uh, I am just getting over teaching. Uh, in this academic term, and I like to ask people questions, and I think the monotony of my voice on and on and on is really awful. <laughs> so I hope you'll uh, indulge me if I ask you questions throughout my presentation. Please feel free to answer and stop me with your own questions, etc. Am I working? Okay, good. So I'm going to be talking about the Community Healthy Air Act. Okay, uh, oh, the slides don't change here. Um, so I, I'm framing my presentation in terms of a couple of questions. So what comes out of concentrated animal feeding operations, okay? And then is there evidence that when you live near one or many of these concentrated animal feeding operations, do you get sick, okay? And then based on that, what is the motivation for this piece of legislation that we're talking about, the Community Healthy Air Act? 
Uh, what does it mean? So if we were to pass the law, what would it require of the state of Maryland? And what's going to happen next based on the state of uh, where the bill ended up at the end of the legislative session? Um, so we have conducted, not we, the scientific community knows quite a bit about what comes out of concentrated animal feeding operations. There's a, a lot of variability operation to operation, and there's a lot of variability across species, right? So a chicken house is going to emit something that is somewhat different from a swine farm, etc. But there are a number of compounds that we recognize to be fairly commonly emitted by these types of operations. Okay, so among these are, are particulate matter. Okay, uh, gases like ammonia, especially from chicken houses, uh, hydrogen sulfide, which is very common from swine waste, volatile organic compounds, which you're going to find across both of them. Uh, one of the tricky things about volatile organic compounds is that they're a mixture of chemicals. Okay, there, there's USDA research out there that shows that about 60 different volatile organic compounds can be measured in chicken, in air from chicken manure, and with swine manure, it's more than 300 different compounds. One of the trickiest things from a public health perspective is, for some of these things like particulate matter and ammonia and hydrogen sulfide, we have a pretty decent understanding that when you're exposed to them or when you come into contact with them, they can make you sick. With these volatile organic compounds, we don't know. Many of them have never been studied, and the money to study them just isn't there. So uh, what ultimately happens for people who, who may come into contact with air from these operations is that they're exposed to mixtures of these things. And we're really deficient, as far as science goes, in terms of understanding what it means to be exposed to mixtures of those chemicals. Just because we don't have evidence that those mixtures make you sick, and I'll talk about that in a minute, doesn't mean that they don't. It just means we've never studied it. Okay? So it's always important to keep in mind if we've never studied something, it's difficult to make statements about whether something's safe or not. Okay, uh, we also have other things like animal dander, uh, endotoxin, which is what happens when microorganisms die, uh, pieces of their proteins and their cell linings uh, can actually get into the air and make you sick. And lastly, pathogens, right? So poultry houses, swine farms are rich in microbial life, and there are many different varieties of bacteria. In some cases, when we're using antibiotics, those bacteria are resistant to many of the antibiotics that we would use to treat infections in people, and also certain types of viruses. Okay. And so we have these farms, and on the side of many of them, you'll see these things here. Anyone know what those are? Fans. Fans. Ventilation fans, right? And so why do we have ventilation fans on farms? We get rid of the junk that's inside. <laughs> that, that is true. This is great. So yes. Animals <laughs> stay alive. I was right. assuming that you guys would say people to keep die. them cool, because we don't want our animals to get too hot, and that's partially true. But it's also to make sure that the levels of gases like ammonia and hydrogen sulfide don't get to levels that actually kill the animals. Okay. So, but are people exposed to these pollutants, right? So I said they're in the manure, they're in the animal houses, but do they actually get in a community? So how would that happen? So we have fans, right? So the fans blow air out of the houses, but do people live right next to the fans? Sometimes, kind of, yeah. But often they live a little bit further away from the fans, so they're not standing in front of them with their lungs open, right? So uh, there are lots of ways that people could potentially be exposed to these pollutants. So the fans can blow air into communities, and if I had a pointer, I would point to here. But we also do all sorts of things with the manure, right? What do we do in manure in rural communities? If you all know this already, I'm very sorry. Like oh, thanks. Okay. Um, manure is used as an agricultural fertilizer, right? If we do it at responsible rates, that's not a terrible thing, right? But we often don't. So we spread it on agricultural land as fertilizer, and it can decompose and release a lot of these compounds into the air. And sometimes people live near where we do that. Often people live near where we do that. Um, there are people who work on these operations, and they're exposed to much higher levels of these sorts of things. So we understand that there are these different environmental pathways by which these chemicals, these microorganisms, and other things actually find their way into communities, right? But the question is, do they get into communities at high enough levels and for long enough periods of time to actually make people sick? And that's what a lot of the debate is about right now, okay? But one way to try and answer the question as to whether they make people sick or not is to conduct what we call epidemiologic studies, okay? Where we try and relate some sort of exposure to a chemical or a mixture of chemicals or a bacterium uh, to people getting sick 
usually what we want to do is link it to conditions that we would expect in people if they were exposed, right? So we know that ammonia causes respiratory illness in people, for example. So we would look in a community that we believe to be exposed to these sorts of things and see if we see an increased rate of respiratory illness, all right? So there is quite a bit of that epidemiologic evidence looking at people who live near animal production sites, okay? And I'm not in any way asking you to read this table. I made some shortcuts, okay? <laughs> so I, uh, with some colleagues, uh, we reviewed the epidemiologic uh, literature uh, looking at living near animal production sites. And there's lots of different studies, there are lots of ways they've been conducted, but what we tried to do is figure out where are we starting to see a consistent pattern in these studies, right? Are we seeing studies saying the same health effects tend to occur over and over? And uh, so there are lots of different health endpoints that have been evaluated, but there are a handful where consistently these studies show that if you live close to one of these things, you have higher rates of these, okay? And so mostly these are respiratory outcomes like asthma, asthma came up before, right? Wheeze, uh, lung function problems, COPD. Also impairments to stress and mood comes out consistently, and I've been involved in a couple of studies looking at uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. So this is a, an antimicrobial-resistant bacterial infection that in some cases can be life-threatening, okay? So what I'm trying to say here is, at least for these endpoints, and possibly some of these others, there is consistent scientific evidence that if you live close to these operations, you may come down with one of these conditions, okay? All right, so we know the operations emit these things. We know that the epidemiologic literature supports the idea that people who live near these things can get sick. So there could be a relationship right there. Oh, and I meant to show this also. So um, a lot of this literature that I've shown you here is in pigs, okay, or is it uh, related to swine farms? Okay, do we have a lot of swine farms here in Maryland? Tons of them, right? No, we don't have any. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I have to joke a little bit. It's Saturday. Um, no, so. Uh, but there is an emerging literature, I wanted to make that point. Uh, we uh, and other people around the world actually have been looking at communities around poultry operations, around egg layers, uh, and there is an emerging evidence that these types of operations also can make people sick. But there's a little less certainty around poultry than there is around swine. So this is a study we just published this past year uh, looking at residential proximity to poultry operations and campylobacteriosis, campylobacteriosis, the type of bacteria that you routinely find at and around poultry operations, and infectious diarrhea. Happy Saturday. Um, okay, so at this point, we understand a couple of things. Uh, so we know these chemicals, these other uh, microbial pollutants come out of CAFOs, right? Everybody remember what CAFOs are? Okay. <laughs> uh, we know there are lots of studies of people that live near CAFOs, and we've found that there are certain types of health endpoints that tend to accumulate in those communities, right? But what we want to know well, I'm sorry, but what we do know is that in Maryland, we have folks like Monica and many others who are members of communities or who work with communities that say, I believe these CAFOs that I live near are hurting me, are causing me illness, or are making me sick, okay? So, a uh, couple limitations on what we know right now. I don't want to say that we have the silver bullet, right? So I talked about much of the evidence in the epi studies is from other species. Uh, I said that we know the emissions are coming out of CAFOs, and we know that people live near those CAFOs and could be exposed to those emissions, but we don't have great data on what pollutants get into those communities and how high the levels those pollutants are. And we don't know much about the timing of the pollution, right? Because there are lots of, what factors do you think might influence how high the levels are and how often they are? Any ideas? Seasons. Seasons, yeah. What else? One of the things that they're doing now, because the state doesn't have a sub claims they don't have the subsidy money for the manure sheds is um, the manure is being windrowed inside the houses in between flocks. And as I understand in talking to some people who have done some studies with Purdue, um, the amount of ammonia coming out of the houses is greater in between the flocks when the manure is uh, being composted huh. inside the houses. I've heard that. All right, so these yeah. types of practices are going to make things change over time. So. What's ex not exciting, that's the wrong yeah. <laughs> what is, what is, To a scientist, it's exciting. But to, to, that would explain why you know we might assume that we're only going to see spikes in ammonia when we actually have chickens in the houses, right? That seems to make sense. But if they're storing the manure in the houses in between flocks, we may see spikes of manure, uh, spikes of ammonia, even when there aren't chickens. So that's very helpful. But anyway, 
Are we monitoring right now? Do we do we have any way of knowing if there were spikes? Absolutely not. We don't. Okay. So, so phosphorus a big issue coming out of these. It is, but phosphorus is a bigger water pollution issue than an air pollution issue. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm mostly talking about air pollution today, but you're absolutely right. Water pollution is a whole separate. I mean, that causes the algae. It does absolutely. Dif different context? No, not different context. Different uh, environmental medium. But you're absolutely right. So I'm, I'm narrowly, very, being very scientist, narrowly focused on air today. But we maybe we can talk about water after. Okay. All right. Okay. So anyway, uh, last point. Um, we need data, right? I'm a scientist. I'm, I'm obsessed with data. I, I have some intuition. I have a hypothesis that there is likely something going on here. But in order for me to get in front of the legislative body and say X is causing Y, we have to have some data to back it up, right? So, so that's that's the motivation for this community health care. Okay. So I got involved with the act this year, but it's not the first year the act uh, was introduced. So last year, there was a version of the Community Healthy Air Act, and what it called for was an assessment by Maryland Department of the Environment to actually look to see if CAFOs were compliant with laws. It also involves some monitoring, right? That doesn't sound bad, right? Unless you think about it a little bit more. Do we have laws that are protective of the situations that I described? Maybe. Do they work? Maybe not. I don't know, tough to know, okay? So the compliance element of this, I would, I would say maybe is a limited value, okay? And the monitor, monitoring is good. What comes out of monitoring? Anyone know what monitoring is? Collecting data. Collecting data over time, right? So that sounds awesome. But if you don't do it right, and you go to court, and you say, I did these monitors, and, and here's the data, and then the other side brings an expert who says, well, you did this wrong, and you did this wrong, and you did this wrong, and therefore your data are invalid, problem, right? So, you know, working with people like that all the time, sadly, um, I developed this uh, thick skin about data quality, and I'm really worried that when we generate data, if it's not of high enough quality, if we don't have quality control measures in place, we can't use it as to support an argument. So I thought, you know, one little thing I could contribute to an effort like this would be to try and help rewrite the bill in a way that would create the best quality data that would stand up in court or stand up in a legal battle would be a very strong basis for future regulation. So uh, thus the Community Healthy Air Act. And we were lucky, uh, I think, through the work of people like Monica uh, and other folks at Food and Water Watch and probably a hundred other people in this room and outside of it, um, they got Senator Madaleno on board to introduce the reintroduce the Community Healthy Air Act. Um, he's running for governor, uh, and then we also have Robin Lewis, who blew me away with her tenacity on this issue. She is really yes, powerful. Amazing. So, so very, very fortunate uh, to have such strong bill sponsors. So, let me tell you what the bill is about. How am I doing on time? Keep going. Okay. This, this is, and then, is Dr. Ball is going to do the wrap up? That's my last Where's, All right. where's our mind? How yeah. about time? Um, we're going to Oh, okay. Okay, good. All right, so here's what the bill does, okay? So the idea behind this bill is, anyone ever heard of the National Academy of Sciences? Anybody? Yes. Okay, are they pretty credible? Generally, they're considered to be credible, okay? And what they do is they're given a research question. They try and bring together the best possible experts to answer that research question. And then they have the report peer reviewed, and then they release it. And what they release is often accepted to be fairly credible and meaningful. Okay, so I suggested something that kind of mimics that process, but within the state of Maryland. Okay, so what this bill would do is it takes the, my boss, the dean of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and the dean of the University of Maryland School of Public Health, and it tells them you need to appoint experts to sit on a community air quality committee, okay? And so their task, once on this committee, would be to design an air monitoring plan, right? So if you get the right people together who have the appropriate expertise, you'd hope that they would design an awesome air quality monitoring plan that would stand up in court, okay? And so these are the different types of experts that the bill specifies need to be on that committee, okay? So air pollution sampling and monitoring, right? So sampling, air pollution. Spatial statistics and modeling, right? Because we can't set up an air pollution monitor every three feet. You wouldn't be able to move around if you really expensive. Okay? Exposure science, so people who 
understand quantification of exposure, figure out how much of the chemical do you get in your body. Environmental epidemiology, those are the people who study if you're exposed, what does it mean? Uh, toxicology, similar related field, we're trying to understand the impacts of chemicals on human tissues. Uh, human health risk assessment, that's what I do, trying to figure out when we know what the chemical does and at what levels, and we know how much you've been exposed to, can we forecast how likely you are to get sick before you get sick? Okay, preventive medicines of doctors and regulatory compliance, all right? So this would be the committee that would come together and try and set up a plan. That's all they're doing, just setting up a plan. Okay, are they the ones collecting data? They are not, they are not. They, they establish the plan, that's very important, okay? We'll come back to that later. And then later, when we were fighting about the bill, uh, and this may come as a surprise, but the bill was a big fight, um, there was language added uh, to include experts in commercial animal production and animal house construction. Okay? So we have, may have mixed feelings about that, but I actually think that's a good idea. Okay? And we'll talk about that possibly later. All right, so more about what the bill does. Um, so the committee makes a, an air sampling plan. The bill actually names some of the pollutants I described, but leaves the door open to include other pollutants that might be relevant that the committee would actually identify as such. All right? And so here's part of the neat process. So I'm an academic. I like peer review. We all know what peer review is. It means other scientists who are not involved in the work get to read it and say, this sucks, or this is amazing, and you should move forward. <laughs> so, so we offer it for peer review for, in two different ways, right? So we, anyone in the public, industry, you guys in this room, anyone else, can submit formal comments. And everybody gets to see those comments, right? Uh, so everybody can evaluate the comments, and also the response of the committee to the comments, OK? And then we have this invited expert peer review, where Maryland Department of the Environment will identify experts from all those different disciplines I've talked about before and send it to them. And it's, it's blinded, right? So we don't know who those experts are until after. And they submit anonymous comments that the committee has to receive and use to modify the plan if any modifications are requested, okay? So there really is opportunity for input, it is transparent, and at the end of the day, what we get is the plan, just the plan, no monitoring yet, okay? Then, the Committee on Air Quality Monitoring is gonna fix the plan, post it online so everybody can see it, and then it's given to the Maryland Department of the Environment who will conduct the air quality monitoring and will follow the plan. How's that sound? That's great. Sounds pretty reasonable, right? What's going to come out of that plan? Data. My Local favorite data. thing. Local data, right? This That's very important too. Maryland data, not data Pennsylvania data. data. <laughs> okay. All right. So the committee's totally out of the equation when the plan is being implemented. Okay. And then the data are going to be made public. So any of us, and you guys like data too? Well, you can have data also, and you can do your own analysis. I can do mine. MDE can do theirs. So MDE will also use the data and do a public health assessment, which it will then make public. And it's going to share all of that with the governor and the legislature. Okay. So then, if you know, who knows what the outcome is going to be, right? We don't know, and that's why we collect data. We don't go into it trying to stack it so the data answer it question in a certain way. We want it unambiguous, sorry, not unambiguous, objective uh, approach to collecting these data, okay? And based on the outcome of, of the analysis, maybe a, a different type of action will be suggested. Yeah. Was there, uh, yeah, uh, when you mentioned the data, are they also collecting data on health outcomes or health statistics of uh, people around that area? They're not. It's a good question. Yeah, but then how are they going to correlate what's going on with uh, what pollution levels are with uh, what the health impacts are. That's what risk assessment is for. Um, so we're collecting data about air pollutant concentrations. And what's most important about these data is they are data in the community, right? So again, if I can collect data outside the fan, but if I collect data outside the fan and I say, see, what I measured outside the fan means you're going to get sick, Another expert could come in and say, well, that's just outside the fan. That's not what you breathe every day. That's not in your front yard, or that's not what actually gets into your community. So these data are going to be in the community for the first time. So that's a big deal. But we're not going to collect health data. That's a different type of study, a much more expensive study. And I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. But a study like this, among other things, might set the stage for saying, hey, we need to do a study of health outcomes in that community. And we can, on the other hand, use those data to say, we believe people will get sick because of the levels and the timing and the nature of the pollution that's actually in the community. Okay. okay. Yes? 
I was gonna say um, the state. Can't the state fund that because when like I work for the state of Delaware and they sent out before open enrollment, they sent out this training that you got to do to help um, lower the cost for health insurance. Mm -hmm. So can they use the data from public health places, hospitals and stuff to figure out what's causing these health problems? Maybe we can fix the health problems. Maybe. So what you're doing, what you're talking about is what epidemiologists are trying to do all the time is identify other sources of data that are already being collected. We know how they're doing it, and we then could possibly use those to do an epidemiologic study. So that, that's a great thought. That's a great thought. But if, terms, if there's areas like poultry plants and farm properties causing health conditions, causing health conditions, can't the state say, okay, you causing health shorts to rise? Don't they see that right in there and you should do something about it? It is such a great question. It's such a <laughs> It, it, it. Does asthma only come from poultry operations? No. Does respiratory disease only come from poultry operations? No. And, and do infections come from other sources possibly? So what you're doing is what we all do. We see a condition, we see a likely source, and we say it's probably bad. But making, <laughs> making a regulator step in and assign blame, it, it's not so simple. And I think what this is trying to do is move us closer to develop the forensic evidence we need to try and say there's a reason to blame that facility for that outcome. But I'm, I'm with you, and I often feel that way. It, it's tempting to feel that way, but it, it isn't so simple, sadly. Yeah? Does it compel them to do anything with the data? It doesn't. It doesn't work out. It doesn't. And that was by design. And that was what, I'm sorry? It was by design. Yeah, and then what if, what happens after this? Is it just to do one study, or will studies be ongoing? Will they say it comes back and it's, we can't rule it in, we can't rule it out? Does it continue? Or? We'll get to that. We will get to that, but it's one study. Yeah, one study. And let me say at this point, and I'll come back to that. Okay. Making this happen right. Right. is hard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. just data. Right. Okay. Um, I'll I'm, I'm, I'm spoiling myself. All right, uh, that sounds weird. So what happened? What happened, right? This sounds reasonable, right? What are we asking for? We're asking for smart people to develop a plan to generate data. That's pretty much it, right? The only potentially thing that might put anyone on guard is the idea that MDE is actually going to use the data to draw conclusions about whether or not there's a problem. But that's it, right? So there's no follow-up. There's no we're shutting down poultry farms, etc. None of that. Okay, so what happened? So I would like to say that you know the people in this room and some others gave a really strong showing. It was a very, very, very hostile hearings in the General Assembly. The opposition did a full court press. Okay? It was uh, not one of the most pleasant uh, two hours of my life. But, um, <laughs> you hung in there tough. <laughs> uh, but the bill died in committee. Okay? Uh, that's not to say that the sponsors didn't do everything they could to try and make it work. But uh, I, I guess the good thing is uh, is that it's not over, okay? But I, I, this is where I really wanted some, some community participation. What do you think the biggest criticisms from the opponents of this bill? Any ideas? It's going to require further regulation. Further regulation? Uh, you know what? I think that was implicit. People didn't say that. It's, yeah. It was the cost the estimate cost. from the first year to the second year, that did you part see? Of it, the cost. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah, it's too expensive, right? And so we almost look the same. The bias on the design. Yes. So that's the number one. Okay. The bias. So when we bring all the people together that I described, they're going to design a plan that's going to damn the industry. And whatever they come out with, no matter what, no matter the actual data, the design of the study is going to say we should no longer have this industry. That was accusation number one. Despite the fact that the plan was going to be peer reviewed, and that criticism, if it were valid, could be made during the plan design peer review and it would be changed. But anyway, okay, what else? What else do you think was a big criticism of this bill? Any ideas? Oh. Yeah. Oh, never mind. Was you were there. I didn't have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll just go through. So the, the committee initially yeah. did not include agricultural production experts, and that got changed. Okay, so it will going forward, and I think that's a legitimate criticism. Uh, here's a big one that, that I was very confused by. Cities have pollution, too. <laughs> okay? So that's like saying, uh, just because you have cancer, you can't care about diabetes. 
Yeah, and then there was right. ozone or something. Yeah, yeah. And there was there was a point well, that was mm-hmm. something was silly. Except the timeline was too city short. air pollution is actually monitored. Right. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And that was exactly. a point that, that was made. Yes. The timeline of the bill was too short. We couldn't get the work done in the amount of time specified. There's a simple fix for that. Mm-hmm. Give us more time. Right. <laughs> um, and then lots of other silly <laughs> arguments. So uh, anyway, where do we go from here? I, I hope I didn't depress you uh, because I, I want to say that I've done this before um, with other things in the agricultural community, with, with the drug industry. And when you do something that might threaten someone's business, um, they don't like it. <laughs> Surprise! Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it. And that doesn't mean that we can't bring the evidence, bring the advocacy, and actually change public opinion. And I think public opinion is what actually is most important. I think we have enough evidence at this point. I think we need to, to develop whatever's needed to get them to let us to collect the data. I think the data are going to be the solution to the problem because you know what? There, there are a couple outcomes. The data show there's a problem and we act to solve the problem. Or it's also possible the data show there isn't a problem, in which case we're all barking up the wrong tree and we need to change our strategy. Okay? But until we collect the data, we can't come. So I'll stop. But don't lose hope, really. I, there are such great people in this room and working on these issues that we're going to make this happen. It may take three years, it may take four years, but we will. Yeah. I mean, it's good. Before, you, before you close that up, yeah. if you go back to your first slide, you showed a, an outline of Delaware and uh, Maryland. Mm-hmm. And you had a blue dot, two blue dots, one looked like approximately in Salisbury, and the other one where I come from in Millsburg, we say instead of as, as the bird flies, it looked like it was about seven miles as the odor wafts. <laughs> I'm wondering what that blue dot in Delaware stood for. You totally caught me with my pants down. So I <laughs> took that map just to show the eastern shore and the parts that I was talking about. So you probably know more about those blue dots than I do. Sadly. Oh, that's what I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, it, is it something I don't know about? It is not. Actually, I have that map in Do you want that? I'm, I'm sorry for going. Don't feel sorry. All right. Thank you for your attention. Come on. Well, I guess I can't. down <laughs> So, down to the tall. So, um, I did want to show this though, um, to, to, uh, just to show some of the activities that went on. Um, uh, there actually was a poll conducted. Oh, it's not showing right here. Is it slideshow? Oh, kind of slide. Sorry. Let's try that. Sorry. It's kind of hard because you the cognitive dissonance of expecting the slides to change there and having them only change here. Get rid of this. Okay. Um, yeah. So there actually, um, Center for a Livable Future did conduct a poll, um, and because of the community awareness that uh, the concerned citizens had started. <laughs> And work that was done by other organizations throughout the state, um, uh, Waterkeepers Chesapeake with their Fair Farms campaign, uh, ASTI Coastal Trust work, socially responsible agricultural projects work. Um, it did raise consumer and, and, and citizen awareness um, to the problem, which helped the bill get a little bit further this Definitely. year and will do even more um, next year. And. Um, I wanted to show this slide because these were all residents from the Lower Shore uh, uh, with Senator Madaleno um, at a rally outside of the State House. Mm. Okay, so next. <laughs> um, so now we're going to have Dr. Kirkland Hall kind of wrap all this up, but especially to talk about um, advocacy and activism. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Hall. And uh, I just put this together as a little background for you about Somerset County. So uh, Dr. Hall um, teaches at University of Maryland Eastern Shore. He's been a long-time uh, activist and resident of the Lower Shore. And 
but I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. It's a humble and pleasure to be here. I wish it was in a better circumstance mm -hmm. and have to take uh, what is it what is it put before us. Before I get started, could you please stand just for a second? Please? If you can. If you can. If you can. If you can. And take a couple deep breaths uh, before we get back. And I want you to just relax a little bit. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. I need some of that stress from all the scientific data. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Now you got to be relaxed. Uh oh. <laughs> I, I, again, uh, although I teach at the University of Middle Eastern Shore, I'm not here representing the uh, university. I'm a citizen of Somerset County, a concerned citizen. So there's nothing that I say here today represents the university because they're trying very hard to put me off campus because I speak of circumstances as we were going to talk about that that impacts our community. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple of things about the Purdue Hotels. Uh, they also have purchased Purdue Baseball Stadium. And if you ever drive towards Ocean City on 50, you see that beautiful stadium that Frank Purdue's father, Frank Diaz, put up 40% uh, of the money for that stadium. And that's why it's named after him. At UMES, he also provides a number of scholarships uh, for students. Uh, disadvantaged students, okay, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good gesture. Uh, but again, uh, look at the issue of that. I'm a coach, I coach also for 33 years. And as a coach, we look at tendencies. Uh, we talk about data in the scientific arena, which can be biased. But in the coaching profession, <coughs> bias is not a part because look at what individual people do. And we try to develop strategies to prevent that individual or that team to defeat my team. And if our local politicians, would pay attention and as the Burton talked about, what they observe, what they experience, what they've seen all during their lifetime is not taken into consideration by our local nations. Somerset County, where I live and work, is not quite as progressive as Wacomico County and as you've been very progressive in Sussex County and Delaware, we have been labeled the land in which time has forgotten. The TV cameras come down very little. We do not have a newspaper that's circulated in every family. You may not see Somerset County listed unless there's a crime committed in the local summer of Washington, Salisbury, the other time. Our motto is similar either. In it? Italians in anybody know it? Similar either. What is his name? I was adopted by 100% Polish. Similar <laughs> <laughs> either means always the same. Always the same. Always the same. We have been fighting battles in that Canada for years. And yet nothing seems to change unless you take it to court. Uh, Monica mentioned a few minutes where people lost their jobs fighting for this issue in Worcester County and so, Wakamba County. And just very briefly, in 1986, I filed the first lawsuit uh, as a member of the NAACP. Uh, with the American Civilist Union attorney by the name of Christopher Brown, constitutional attorney, and I became very close after the years. I was in I was just started uh, as administrator. And the president told me to be careful because the lawsuit included Governor Merlin, who was Governor Donna Schaefer. He said, you know you're gonna get fired because you're suing the governor. It's 1986. In 2018, we're still working. <laughs> Of five lawsuits we filed, and we 
also on each one. But the sad thing about it, we have been trying to employ our legislators as you look at the KFO, you saw the picture, especially on Backbone Road and also another community called West Post Office Road, which is inundated with the large scale industrial poultry farm <coughs> of business. One of our delegates, and I'm not going to call their names, not necessary, uh, those over in Annapolis, uh, we had to testify, got it upset with them. And I heard that too. <laughs> and, we, and I'm testifying against k -Fos, and he was arguing with me. He said, Mr. Hall, do you think I'm a Baptist minister too, just in case. <laughs> he said, Mr. Hall, don't you think that the poultry industry provides jobs for the community? I said, yes, it did. But do you honestly think that someone that's going to navigate elementary school, high school, college, or trade school is going to search for a job working as a laborer in the poultry industry. Right. Yes, I love chicken. I'm gonna get some this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> love it. But it has its place. Yeah. The farms have <coughs> their place. Right. No one wants to live near 15, 16, and sometimes 20, 24 houses. The young lady's not here to ask that question, and Jonathan did a good job trying to explain it. Well, you're investing your home. You're facing your problem. Who wants to give it up when you work all your life to have a place to stay? And then when something happens to you, your children have a place to stay. No one wants to give that up. But big business has taken the place of loyalty to our communities. We are the taxpayers. Yes, <laughs> your school of business, all those that the corporation provide for the university. Great job, that's all right. But is that such a thing as ethics, morality, humanity? It does not exist when you're talking the dollar bill. How much money do individuals need in order to survive? How much money do they produce? The Mount Air, the Tysons. How much money do those family members need? <coughs> And a lot of us working on less than $15 an hour. And $15 an hour today's time is $13 an hour. How much do they need to survive? But yet, yet, <coughs> each day you wake up, you wonder what's going to be next door to you. We battled relentlessly. <coughs> our county commissioners. We found out that three are being funded by the Purdue industry. There's only five on the committee. So somebody give me a hand. Go back to mention it. I, I, I can go. So, you know, so just let me know when they get close to my time. But they're funded by the Purdue industry. So they're not going to vote against anything that Brother Satterfield bring to their attention. So is that fair to the citizenry? Is that fair to us? We're supposed to be elected to care for the people who live in our districts. Yes. That's why they were elected. But once they're elected, it goes out the window. Some say Canada, the poorest county in the state of Maryland. In the African American community, 48% live in deep poverty. Yet they want to build these KFOs near these communities. <coughs> what are they going to do? You can't children you can't come outside. You can't enjoy a family outing. But then where are they? <laughs> Vacationing some far off land, enjoying themselves, and all poor families are struggling. And one of the things I like to store, I go uh, keep something on top of water, but I like to share this story. I went to a high school called Somerset Junior Senior High School. It was the last <coughs> high school in Somerset County. 
prior to integration. And there was a waterway that ran in front or adjacent to the school. And after we got to run across the country four or five miles, we should stop and drink water out of that river. Now, a little water for water, pure, I mean, sweet, or maybe, maybe didn't know it was coming, but the water was sweet. And we all would take a drink. Even such a man, I ain't going to drink that water. When they saw us do it, they all drank it. I wish I had a picture of you so you could see that waterway today. We could see fish going up the stream to spawn. Now you can't find a fish anywhere. The water is just that polluted, just that filthy, just that dirty. <coughs> but yet, no one is held accountable. No corporation, no industry, no business is held accountable for that disaster. Some say county ranks as the 20th worst county to live in in the United States. 20th worst county to live in. Let's go to Wall Street Business Journal article in 2018. The 20th worst county. And yet, the legislators are constantly bringing industry that are running all of our young people away. I raised eight, I'm sorry, ten adult children, I raised 18 children, ten adult children. And one daughter stayed, remained in the county. She works at the health department. My youngest daughter is a medical doctor with asthma. I said, Dad, it's still well. I come back to the summer. I can't, I, I won't be able to breathe. I, I, I can't stand the smell. My mother was asthmatic. My sister was asthmatic. I'm asthmatic. I struggle. My sister worked at Purdue Poultry Plant in Salisbury. And I feel for every day because I can't do anything to help her. They have the jobs. They have the jobs. So that's the only agreement I could tell my legislator that at least she has a job. But it's worth it. She suffers each and every day. What company? is going to bring that technology plant into Somerset County surrounded by that foul smelling air. Nobody! I say that and I explain it, but you don't know. What you? <laughs> I don't know! I'm looking! Yeah, they were going to bring wind farms, but even that was the big <laughs> yeah. One thing they did do, uh, we do have a solar on this in the county, and it's growing. Uh, that was prospective when formed, but that, they stopped. Anything that's positive, right. yeah. anything that's positive, they find some fault with it. But bring two or three more chicken farms, or okay, folks in the community, they left it. So we ask all the time, do you understand what you're doing to our community? Do you understand? Look at you like you're insane. That's like you like you don't like you like we can't read, like we can't study. Right. That we don't need research. Mm -hmm. And we ask ourselves, well, you know, that's why I use the term tendency, only because we bring the scientific data to them, they throw it out the window. <coughs> it doesn't apply to us. It doesn't apply to us. If you got a chicken in California. <laughs> they call the issue from what that chicken in Somerset County called the same problem. It's, it's, it's a chicken. Came for the egg. It's a chicken. But data does not mean anything to them. And on campus where I work, H B talk before I wanted justice, H B C G. It's look at Black County University. We are exactly 1.4 miles. From all the houses. Yeah, that's ridiculous. With the possibility of bringing 10 to 15 more. I spoke to a student from Salt Lake State. We had a panel discussion on th Tuesday night. Tuesday, put you on the ball. <laughs> Tuesday night. And we came out of the Student Services Center. I said, Coach Hall, how, how 
are you staying that smell? I said, son, you get a, you get a meal to it sometimes. And you have to fight and fight and fight. And you're here to help the students at this institution. You get a meal to it. And you try to help and encourage the students. But the school, it's only a few miles. And please, ma'am, and please don't get upset with me. Please. I realize the Purdue Industrial Park plant is what I can, I think, two, uh, almost two miles away from the Salt State University campus. But it's not like having 25 and, and 30 poetry plant where trucks are coming in and out. Right. Trucks are coming through the campus. And yet, no one says a word. What we do, a local politician, they can poetry industry is the engine for jobs, and that's the biggest lie <coughs> that I've ever heard in my life. We are supposed, as professors in the business community, are supposed to increase and improve the quality of life for people that live in their communities. It's like the case here. And we in the rural areas are prime target, Somerset. It is a prime target. It's planned for construct more of these houses. And of course, Somerset is not alone. And we've been battling this and all other problems for you. And I'm going to finish up. No one wants to live a lifetime with this foul odor. We have a faulted wastewater system now that's in our community. We don't have the money for this. You don't have the money for that. But yet, people are paying the taxes and they expect their high quality of life. And I'm going to leave you with this. Every family, every family deserves to feel good about themselves, their neighbors, and their children's future. We dream, we work, and we make some progress. But then, because of the not say that. because of the work of our local officials, we suffer relapse. Because the acts of the wealthy, the unconcerned, and the bought and paid <clears throat> politicians. We're being robbed of our peace, happiness, and tranquility. And I'm gonna leave you with this. Patrick Billy's got three out of these. <laughs> Sociologist Francis Fox Pixon said, when people exercise political courage, rise up in anger and hope, and defy authorities and the status quo, they bring meaningful social reforms. Brooks, Sussex County fat family, you have done that. And I'm leaving this final statement. Motivation is temporary, but inspiration is forever. Thank you so very, very much. I have a I'm asking the students questions. <laughs> no, 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 Go ahead. no, no. Go ahead. seriously. Go ahead. I heard a rumor you're running for office. Are you running for office? Well, I, my daddy has super education. <laughs> uh, he said, Suffer can't beat him, join him. <laughs> so I'm a candidate for Delegate District 38A for Somerset and Northern Worcester County. All right. Any other questions? Yes. So, yes. Now I just got one thing to say. Um, like I told my union president, uh -huh. you don't just represent a couple people. That's right. Friends, you represent a whole union uh, body. So absolutely. the legislator don't re just represent their rich <laughs> yeah, or their exactly. friends or their friends. Absolutely. They represent the whole state. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, question. Yes. Questions for any of the panelists? Any other questions? Should we go up there? Is any kind of uh, moderately expensive uh, procedures possible that could mute the pollution? So, it, interesting that you ask that. Um, not necessarily at the current time, very affordable, but there are um, there there is a business that is developing a new flooring system for poultry houses. 
that will help alleviate a lot of the uh, ammonia creation within the houses. Um, and it would be able to get rid of what they call poultry litter, which is what currently is in the bottom of the houses, which is sawdust and then all the manure on top of it. And they you know, make this layer cake of sawdust and manure. And it's the actual rotting of that sawdust that is causing a lot of, of the problems. Um, so there, there are people out there trying to come up with new technologies that would make it better. But unfortunately, that may also then you know, increase the density of, of these poultry houses even more. Um, and it's while the air emissions is the focus of the Community Healthy Air Act, it's the traffic, uh, it's diesel emissions from all of these tractor trailer trucks going in and out of these communities. Um, the counties do not improve the roadways Absolutely. yet. You have heavier traffic yes. uh, load on these roadways, and there's school bus stops out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are there are some roadways, especially in Somerset County and down in Accomack County, where actually just two sedans trying to pass each other on the road, one has to have a couple wheels off the edge of the road, mm -hmm. and you have giant tractor trailer trucks coming up and down there to haul in to haul out the chickens to move the manure around. And, and you were, I think you were asking a question about phosphorus, and so yeah, that's a, another whole topic. But the state of Maryland did um, do uh, great, did um, regulate uh, the application of poultry manure to uh, the land, and there uh, are now fields that have been tested that have too high a level of phosphorus, so they can no longer put manure on those fields and. Um, we're hoping that once that's fully implemented, that that will help uh, prevent a lot of that phosphorus pollution to, um, to the waterways. Um, but it's also now creating a situation of what do we do with all this excess manure that we can't apply to the fields anymore. Because if you remember my slide up there about the industry's waste disposal, is, has traditionally been just put it out on the fields. Um, so now we're dealing with communities in Somerset County um, having to deal with the possibility of having these waste to energy plants uh, set up where the manure is going to be um, they, uh, basically combusted um, to create uh, gases and, and uh, energy. Um, but again, more heavy industry coming into communities like Somerset County and up in, lower, uh, in Sussex County, Delaware. Um, that you know that now we have start having problems with methane gas leaks, and again, more and more trucking of manures, um, you know, manure and other products, because they're actually even with this excess, we do know that there's not enough manure to generate power for three or four of these manure to energy plants. So that means now other combustibles are going to be brought in too. Anything else? It sounds like it sounds like everybody's heading to lunch. Um, I just want to thank our panelists today. Stay inspired. Community action is really what, what makes things happen. So you want to make it work? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One way or another. Thank you all so much for attending.